The Euro 2020, 2021, whatever the hell it is, uh, the group stages, the group stages are over. It is time for the knockouts, and uh, we we have a lot of things to discuss when it comes to this. So, of course, you can't expect me to do that alone. So, joining me is Sporting Kansas City, uh, someone who covers Sporting Kansas City, writer for the Kansas City Star, Sean Goodwin. You've heard him here before. Uh, he's got a little bit of soccer knowledge that he can drop on us. Uh, Sean, the most important thing, I think, for you, your boys, uh, England made it out. They have a knockout game coming up. We will certainly discuss that. But when we look back at the entire group stages now that they are over, um, there's a lot here that I think a lot of people wouldn't have predicted, specifically uh, the fact uh, how certain groups, uh, Group E in particular, turned out. So this group stage is here, I mean, just in general. Um, how... Uh, did you enjoy watching the group stage soccer? That's the question I think that I actually really want to know. I always enjoy watching a group stage <laughs> soccer. I guess I mean in particular. Yeah, you know, I think there's something a little bit magical about the group stages as well. Oh. And you know, I I got a little sad yesterday. I will I will preface. You say I cover Sporting KC. Let's not forget Kansas City's NWSL team. You're right. You're right. I, the uh, only reason I didn't say that is because the name is so damn long. <laughs> KC NWSL. So I, I was working during the Franks, um, whatever it was, Germany hungry for Franks Portugal games. Mm -hmm. So I haven't seen those, which is unfortunate because obviously that was who England plays. Um, but as a whole, yeah, you know, if I wasn't working and. As the nature of being a sports journalist and working from home, I would typically, yeah, you know, wake up, do my morning run, either listen to a podcast or try and listen to a radio broadcast while I run. Get home, and at that point, yeah, you know, I've, I've got game, Euro games on TV until probably about, you know, 4, 4.30 o'clock. Right. Um, and then Copa America gets going. So... Yeah, it's a little bit of sweet that we've lost it now. Now we've got a couple of days breaking. The knockout, knockouts are thrilling as well, of course, because hypothetically it's the best teams in Europe. Mm. If you call um, Ukraine and Sweden the best teams in Europe, I mean, take your pick. But I think that was a little harsh. A little harsh on Sweden. Well, uh, they, Sweden did win their group, so to yeah, be fair to yeah. them. Yeah. But. Even after that Spain debacle with like fourteen percent possession, but that's okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's happened to everyone in FIFA, so I'll allow it. Yeah, it's happened to you versus me in FIFA. Yeah, I don't uh, know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no. As for the games itself, though, yeah, I mean, uh, going too many boring games. Uh, there was a boring game England versus Scotland. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But outside of that, you know, obviously I can't remember every single game off the top of my head. I guess talking about Spain, Sweden, I was a nil nil game, but at least Spain looked really good in the first half. You know, we got kind of a glimpse into what they would go on to do eventually mm. uh, against poor old Slovakia or poor old uh, Poland. Yeah. No, it's Slovakia. Yeah, it was Slovakia. He got um, slapped about, actually. Mm. Not good. Um, I think mean, that's what really dropped them out of uh, standings too for the third place team. But anyway, yeah. so yeah, you know, great group stage, can't complain. Um, good to see Hungary wearing the whipping boys of Group F, <laughs> as my predicted. You know, he got two yeah. points, he got two draws out of that. Uh, the only loss, obviously, being uh, Portugal, that 3 0 BS game with uh, double deflection, penalty, and garbage time Ronaldo goal. So, it would have been nice to see Hungary go through, is what it is. Um, Scotland was shite. That was kind of funny. <laughs> uh, and even, even North Macedonia. They went through them, so... Yeah, it's what I say about us, I know. Yeah. But we still finished first, so jokes on the rest of the group. Uh, North Macedonia, you know, again, they didn't get a single point, but... And he only scored two goals, eight against, which I think is really crushing. Uh, I'm trying to think, what was it? Going Netherlands game where they kind of got smacked about, I assume. It was uh, three nil. Netherlands beat them. Yeah, and they lost to Austria three one. It was got late goals, 
But again, every, every single one of their games, you know, it wasn't like, you know, they were totally outclassed. Yeah. So I, I mean, if you watch, if you watch the qualifying, there were certainly many, many uh, matches that were far more lopsided than you know, oh, even yeah. North Macedonia versus Netherlands or something. Oh yeah. So yeah, can't complain. Uh, Turkey disappointing to concede. What was it? Can see two or three goals in the whole of qualifying, and then can see eight in three games. Yeah, that's gonna be that, that's gonna be disappointing if you're Turkey. You know, I mean, Turkey's not a powerhouse, and they can't expect to go into the Euros expecting to win. But you know, fans can always dream, right? That's, that's the whole that's the, that's the beauty of it all. And I I don't say that taking a piss because I'm an England fan who thinks. <laughs> We've been to one final in our whole history, and it was 1966, which we won. So, 100% record, baby. Just saying. <laughs> well, well, their, yeah, uh, yeah. their their journey back starts now, and they got a they got a tough match to start out with. I mean, I guess yeah. I guess we should just go into that. Now, I was gonna save it for the end to see if I could catch you uh, being negative about about the team at some point. Not that that's that hard. Every English fan I've spoke to, but uh, yeah, yeah, they got they got to face Germany to start out with. Um, on a scale of one to ten, how confident are you that the three lions are pulling that one out? Right now, um, based purely on play in that, takes a tough one. I, I'm over fifty percent. I'm hovering like a six point five seven. In okay. the fact that, in that might seem high. I think a big part of it is, you know, it is a rivalry. Uh, you know, it's an old, old rivalry. Obviously, we beat West Germany back in 66. And I'm sure they don't give a shit because they've won a few World Cup things, but we sure haven't. Uh, <laughs> but it's a rivalry nonetheless, whether it's on the battlefield or if it's on the soccer field. Yeah. And that, that will, you know, that'll centre things out as a whole. And obviously, like I said, I didn't watch the Hungary game. But from what I heard and just looking at what happened, you know, not solid defensively. Uh, the Portugal game, again, that was, everyone was touting that as one of the best games in the tournament, just because there was six goals, but it wasn't a pretty game. Mm-hmm. And then they probably should have lost to France 3-0, which of course is France, but they were just completely outclassing that game, in my opinion. Yeah. And, England-wise, the Scotland game was dreadful. I think everyone can agree on that. And okay, we've only scored two goals, but defensively, we've it may be a you know it, it's probably because we're playing bloody five at the back and two defensive midfielders. It's a bit grim, mm. but Czech Republic and Croatia barely sniffed our goal in either of those games. We created chances. We probably should have scored more than two goals. Um, if we get a, a forward who likes to score on the big stage and not Harry Kane, that would be a like if we start Rashford and then you know you've got Foden, Mountain, Sancho, or Grealish or whoever behind, that, that's great. I think get Rashford's pace in behind, he's showing he's a killer and come to goal himself, right? But it's not going to happen because it's England, Germany, and Kane's the captain, and Southgate doesn't have a pair of balls, so. <laughs> I mean, as as an outsider, it definitely feels like watching England, the whole setup is designed for a counterattack. The problem is there's just no lethal threat when it comes to actually converting those chances. I mean, it's not it's not going to be a situation where there's, you know, a dozen great chances at goal. You're only going to get one or two, uh, yeah. you know, depending on the team. And, and, and so you would think that Harry Kane would thrive in a situation like that, but well, it's just not been there for him. I didn't even know about that because you talk about it being a counter attack, you know, a counter attacking system. What do you want when you're going up the field on a counter attack? I mean, you want certainly a lot of pace and you want someone that is go, able boom, to, boom, to pace. play those balls. Yeah, like you said it, boom, pace. What does Harry Kane not have? Yeah, he doesn't have the pace. Not mm. not that you'd want from a single high striker like that. Exactly. Um, and you know, obviously we have the pace of Sterling, uh, which has been great. Foden's got a little bit of wheels on him. Grealish can make a killer pass. I mean, you know, you, you finally start the kids and he gets an assist 13 minutes in. Who was a force mm-hmm. against uh, Czech Republic? But yeah, it's 
and that's why I'm asking for someone like Rashford and that obviously you know Kane's goal scoring record it does speak for itself in the Premier League and maybe you know there's probably some Tottenham fans sitting here pissed off as I'm talking <laughs> and of course in Jose Mourinho's system very dull very counter attacking defence for football Harry Kane yeah. did get goals when giving a chance so it's not completely out of the equation but so far through three games um, it's not really big dividends has it so at yeah. that point you, you can't go through a tournament and your star striker not be doing star striker things Yeah. and yeah. you have to at some point if you're on a win make a damn change have you know the, the greatest managers and the greatest players and whatever the, they're the ones who they take a risk and make that change and yeah it works I guess for someone like you who's been around dressing rooms and you've seen uh, some of the interaction that goes on it, it is obviously a very delicate balance when you start talking about uh, what you're going to do with your captain and, and how you treat players that have been a big part of the setup for a long time Harry Kane would certainly qualify under that so there is a little bit of a risk uh, if Southgate were to say you know this is this is England's biggest game since World Cup 2018, right? A Euro, a, a, a Euro stage, a Euro uh, knockout stage. Um, but we don't want Harry Kane in this game. Now, from a tactical perspective, it I, I agree with you. I think it has to be done. I think he has just not been good enough for what England needs at this point. Uh, and I think it's evidenced by the fact that he hasn't. He just hasn't really been a factor at all in either of England's two goals. Um, so. Obviously, from, I think, a tactical perspective, it works, but from a dressing room perspective, is it a risk to take someone like Harry Kane and not play him in a game of this magnitude? Well, here's the thing. If part of the role of being a captain is obviously, as a captain, you know, you you are typically one of the better players. Right. But also, as a captain, it's taking on that responsibility, but also understanding leadership and putting yourself putting the team before yourself um obviously we've seen a little bit of history in the past of harry kane with with tottenham mm-hmm. uh champions league final league cup final recently he was injured for both he forced his way back into both and he wasn't fit yeah um i mean I, again i i only say jaws and henderson because obviously i'm a liverpool fan i'm most familiar with it and there's another instinct i can think of but there's, there's big times where you know Henderson because of plays and it's it's publicly came out saying that he wouldn't be able to give 100% mm-hmm. and he's literally sat on the bench or not played because what's a half healthy midfielder what's got used to anyone you know yeah yeah and you, you begin to ask a question of again that guy comes into asking leadership material and plenty of there's been plenty of scrutiny about Kane as leadership and lack of you know, control or whatever. So, if you're a captain and you're not performing and your team's in major tournaments in a huge game, do you throw yourself out there in a sense of, I'm the captain, I'm going to figure this shit out? Mm -hmm. Or do you say, all right, we need to do something different and I want my team to win? Yeah, and and, and on a stage like this, um, those kinds of decisions, I think, are, are magnified. Because yeah. one player can really make a difference. And someone like Harry Kane, as dangerous as he is just in general, uh, the fact that he hasn't really been able to get it going for England at all over the last couple of years, and, and certainly not with this current setup, uh, yeah. that could make a huge difference. You know, you never know if there's yeah. whoever you might have replaced him with would be able to bag that crucial mm-hmm. goal. And one goal is probably all it'll take. Not one goal total, but it will be a one goal margin, I assume, yeah. against Germany. Yeah, and that's the thing as well. On the, on the club level, you know, if you're a top level team between the league and the cups and Europe, you're playing 50 plus games a season. Mm. Rotation is obviously necessary, but if if you're a star player who's not playing Greece, it's uh, you know, you, managers are usually willing to build you out to that funk. And you know, get get you back. The only way you get better is obviously through playing and you know getting yeah. back in the group, right? Yeah. You can't do that on the international stage. 
you've got three group stage games. He's playing them all. He's coming off them all. He got subbed out of two of them. And we're now at the point of you're three wins away from England's first ever final since 1966. And it's literally yeah. win or go home. There's no room to be getting into the groove. It's win or go home. Yeah, I absolutely agree. This is this is not the time to be experimenting or, or building guys back. When I mean, you do, you have to put your best eleven out on that field. And I do think, if you are, uh, if you are a manager, you should have the respect of the players to at least be able to go in and 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 say, look, I know that this isn't going to be very popular, but I have to put my best team out on the field today, and that best team does not include Harry Kane. Or who, or whoever, whoever it may be, but in this particular yeah. situation, talking about Kane, um, I would hope that a manager of a major national team that expects to be competing for international trophies would have the respect of his players to at least be able to deliver an unpopular decision, and 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 they would, yeah. they would understand that sometimes these things need to be done. No, it is. And, you know, kind of segueing just things to the bracket as a whole, mm-hmm. you also have to bear in mind that, I mean, Christ, this is such a good chance to make it to a final, because I was, I was bitching initially, and uh, obviously, you know, how it's set up, four of the third place teams go through, mm-hmm. which means four of the first place teams play third place teams, and then there's two, two first place who have to play a second place still. Right. England is one of those unfortunate enough where they had to play second place. But not only that, they had to play it from the damn group of death. Like, <laughs> like ways to just roll the dice and get snake eyes. Like, it's not, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, and I... Ter- draw. But, um, sorry, Griff. But no, then you're looking ahead. at... So we play Germany. I'm a little pissed off. But when you, you look at where we are in the rest of the brackets, we've got Sweden or Ukraine next. I mean, that doesn't scare me. We beat, we beat Sweden pretty handily in the World Cup quarterfinals, actually, back in 2018. Uh, and then below us, Netherlands have looked, Netherlands have looked good, but you've not really played anyone major. You don't have Virgil van Dijk, obviously. Right. Uh, Czech Republic, we've already beat them. Uh, we beat them 5-0 at Wembley in the qualifying. It was a, it was a, pre, like a friendly game. Yeah. Um, and then Wales and Denmark. Like, Jack... That is what we'll be facing in the quarterfinals and semifinals. While on the other side, you have Belgium, Portugal, Italy, Austria, France, Switzerland, Croatia, and Spain, which is an absolute gauntlet. Yeah, that's unreal. Uh, I and think. I, yeah, I'll go. Was it when I was looking at this and and you know filling out my provisional bracket before the tournament started and all that? Uh, I definitely noticed the same thing as well. That almost every scenario that I thought was realistic in the group stages would end up with this bottom half of the bracket being very wide open, uh, which yeah. is actually why in my uh, in my predictions, in my final predictions for this, I actually have Denmark going all the way to the finals because I think, uh, obviously this is before what happened to Christian Eriksen, but um, I figure that this part of the bracket would be really open for a team like them to make a run. And that same thing applies to England as well. It certainly seems as though the favorite in this bottom half is going to be the winner of that England Germany game. Obviously, they're not they're not unbeatable once they come out of that. But if you had to pick, I think it would be the winner of that. And um, I mean, let's not sleep on Wales either, though. I, uh, I I don't like Scotland's back in the old Wales and let's not forget they made it to the semi-finals in 2016. Right, right. They have, they, they have experience on this team of going deep in the tournaments. They're probably hungry to do it again, and. Also, Group A, you know, they only got four points, but got a loss. Um, it was they were the only team to hold Italy to one goal. Switzerland, yeah. and he lost three 0 piece, and that was kind of a. I felt sorry for Wales in that game, to be honest, because yeah, uh, go one 0 down, which whatever, and then they got a awful red card decision in like the sixtieth minute. Yeah, and Galatia, you know, you're down to ten men against Italy. You, you can't really do much, can you? So yeah, we lose the game one nil, finishing with playing for a fairly good game with ten men against Italy, who is now joint second favourites with England behind France to win it all. Mm-hmm. So they're not a bad little team themselves. Well, that uh, that potential Italy France matchup would be coming in the semi-finals. 
Uh, France has to play Switzerland in their first game. Italy has to play Austria. So obviously they they will both be overwhelming favorites in those games. But you know, as you've said, I mean, this is the Euros, so there there is no guarantee. Uh, but then for both of them, assuming that France and Italy get out of the round of 16, their quarterfinal matches come, in Italy's case, either against Belgium or Portugal. And in France case, France's case, it will come against either Croatia or Spain. So, I mean, you want to talk about just uh, tantalizing matchups for neutrals like myself. Yeah. And for you, England's not in this half, so you'd be a neutral in that sense. Uh, yeah. I mean, every one of these matches, any potential combination, even if... Uh, Austria or Switzerland pull off an upset. Um, every one of these matches is, is really attractive to me on paper. And I think it's because a lot of these teams have really prioritized attacking an attacking style. Yeah. Other than, I suppose, Portugal. But we saw what happened even then. I mean, Portugal is still capable of scoring goals. I and mean, we saw what happened in 2016 and... and how much uh, how much fans really turned on Portugal because of their run to the finals um, and ultimately winning it. But like you look at Belgium and Italy and France, uh, these these are teams that are capable of scoring goals pretty much yeah. at will. It makes it a I really think, fun matchup to think about. I mean, Spain usually says poor. Um, yeah, Slovakia beat them what five nil. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I saw the first half of that and I heard the second half. That was when I was driving to the NWSL game. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that was not pretty at all. So, I'd say, like, you have to think that it's it's probably going to be an attack-minded team that wins this Euros, just how the trends are going. Mm-hmm. Which, I mean, you know, England might make it to the semis and it's, it's worth noting that the semis in the final are in Wembley full capacity yep and I'm sure UEFA will do something to try and even the crowds but at the end of the day it's, it's going to be mostly English that's yep. basically a fun game so you know maybe England's BS is the way to the final and plays five defenders two cents or two defensive mids and <laughs> so I hold on against you know Italy or someone or France and I don't know it's but yeah I got that top half I would hate to be in there but like you said as a as a neutral for now uh, if Switzerland or Austria somehow BS the way to the final and we did I'd be in tears <laughs> but you know as for now yeah it's, it'll be a fun group of games and first one of those is just as we record this, probably by release, only one day away. It's the 26th of June, two days away from us now. Yeah. Uh, Italy, Austria. So that'll be our first taste. First taste of quarter final or round of 16 action along with Wales, Denmark. So let me ask you, uh, as, as a proud Englishman, let's say for the sake of argument that England doesn't make it to the semifinals. So you have four teams going to Wembley. None of them are England. Um, out of all of the rest of these, who do you think is most likely that the English fans will will rally behind as a team? Rally behind? Well, uh, I mean, they got to cheer for someone, right? They can't just be booing during all three games. I'll be so. booing during all three games. <laughs> uh, you know, are we talking realistically as a whole? Uh, as a whole, yeah. I mean, yeah. any, I, I think any of these are potentially realistic. I mean, again, look at Wales from last year, so you never know. Well, or 2016, I mean, rather. That was my choice, and I don't know, maybe, maybe some Englishmen won't agree because they're, they're proud English and fuck the rest of Great Britain. Like, I'm proud English. I have St. George tattoos on my arm. Mm-hmm. But I have no issue with Wales. They're, they're nice to us. Um, I mean, in Liverpool, I only lived 40 minutes away from Wales. I'd go there. My grandparents had a caravan or a trailer as a uh, vacation home or holiday home. All these American English goddamn words. <laughs> um, so we go there every summer, and you know, I, I've been there a bunch. I like Wales a lot. Um, and just again, with them being a British team, if it was Scotland, that's, that rivalry runs deeper. But I like Wales. All right, all right, that's fair, that's fair. Um, if we're being realistic, 
you, you you have to like Belgium just in the fact that you know we were chatting about this another time, and I think we kind of said you know it's you're going all the team and you know their cap they might have passed their golden generation in the sense of at their prime and yeah. they might be a semi final team. But at the end of the day, it, they've never I think even if we've been in a final before. I don't think uh, so. I think they've Port- fallen in the semifinals of several different major tournaments. Yeah. Like Portugal has obviously most recently won it. Italy's won it. France has won it. Spain has won it. Um, Croatia knocked out England, so I have a sore spot for them in 2018. Sure, yeah. Uh, don't really care about Sweden or Ukraine, nor do I expect them to go deep. Germany, screw them. Netherlands has been there. Czech Republic, don't really care. Wales, I just talked about. Denmark, don't really care. So... I guess to from the bottom. If we had a Wales Belgium final, count me in. I'm sure I'm sure <laughs> neutral I'm sure neutral will be pissed. It's like this whole NBA debate of for years people are bitching about super teams and now we're on the cusp of an Atlanta Suns final. Mm-hmm. And people are like, Where's K D? Where's LeBron? I'm like <laughs> Like, you guys have been bitching for years about super teams and you finally get two well built teams in the final. And people are still bitching about it. Mm-hmm. I think I'd be the same. Like yeah. I love Belgium, Wales. I, I don't think it's gonna happen. But it's two teams that haven't been there. There'll be emotions will be running high. Um, rather than just seeing another Germany versus France, so you know what I mean. Yeah, I mean, I guess the thing about the international competition, it, it doesn't bother me so much because these are not. You can't. You can't build these teams right not from a not from a you know acquiring players perspective right you, I mean yeah. you just have the players that are available to you that are of that nation and so to me a, a well-built international team says a lot more about the quality of the players and the quality of the setup in that nation yeah. So it doesn't bother me as much when you get certain countries no. that that tend to dominate. Rather, you know, like in oh, no. in, in get... on the club level, it does bother me for sure. Yeah. Especially no, in have... soccer, where you don't have a cap for you know your salaries or your transfer budget or, or anything else. That that it does bother me. No, I mean, I, I that's not what I mean. It's more like let's say we got a France versus Germany. You know, with the, the casual fan, you know, they'll know the. Griezmanns and Mbappes and um, I'm trying to think of German games that's completely slipping my mind right now um, Max Hummels Manuel Neuer you know people know those names mm-hmm. uh, I, I guess people know from Belgium the sense of Kevin De Bruyne and uh, Lukaku and whatnot but yeah. it's just you know the, the casual fan they want to see the big stars on the big stage and that's nothing against casual fan. I'm not being an Elisa's piece of shit. <laughs> I'm just saying that's what a lot of people would probably prefer. Yeah. And you probably see, not that as sports fans, I think we should give a crap about ratings. And I feel like when sports fans do, it's weird. Like, ah, yeah. this finals ratings are down from last year. I'm like, I don't give a shit. I just enjoyed it just as much. Like, calm down. Um, mm-hmm. But from that point of view, I'm sure less people would watch a Belgium versus Wales final compared to a France versus Germany or something like that. Yeah, yeah, you're probably right. And, I mean, there's there's an argument to say that for teams that have been on that stage, they are more likely to, you know, come out very loose and, and play a little bit more open, maybe a little bit more attacking. It's possible. We've seen it before. If it were to be kind of a Belgium-Wales situation, that they would kind of tighten up and, and yeah. we'd see... Uh, at least a boring first half, if not potentially a boring match. I don't think that's likely, but we, I mean, we have seen that happen before. I mean, how? You know, I, I keep saying Wales because the initial question was teams other than England, but mm. like I said, England's not been to a final since '66. I'm sure England. <laughs> I'm sure England to get to the final and shit himself and be all, you know, be a little bit tighter and nervy. Yeah. And then a, a France or Portugal who's been there. Uh, you've, you've, you've got a few leftovers on Spain, like Busquets and whatnot from the, the dominant 2008 through 2012 days. Sure. Um, where, yeah, you know, they've, they've been there. Obviously, it's a it's an international final. It's still very tense, but, you know, it, it's, it's a big difference having been there two or three times compared to 
your first time, you know. Yeah. Well, one of the, one of the things that sticks out to me, I think it was an interview with uh, with Pirlo, I believe it was, um, talking about the World okay. Cup in uh-huh. 2000, uh, 2008 when when Italy won it, um, or two thousand six rather, sorry, um, where he said, you know, someone asked him what he did before the final and he said i was in my hotel room playing playstation and then i went out got suited up and won a world cup and it's like that's the kind of experience that makes a huge difference in situations like this especially for these players uh who you know have been playing for 18 months with with zero to just a few fans so you kind of get that a rush of adrenaline when the fans do come back and some of these guys that are featuring for these teams have really made their breakthrough into this level of soccer without ever having played in front of fans. Oh you know, yeah, a couple I mean, of these younger guys. The guy I'm most familiar with England, but you know, Calvin Phillips is. You know, I mean, I, I don't even know how old Calvin Phillips is, but you know, people didn't even really know his name until the World Cup. To be honest, you know, he <laughs> he did great for leagues, but. You know, it was his first season in the Prem, which for England is obviously the pinnacle. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he's not experiencing that kind of atmosphere. Yeah. Jude Bellingham um, as well would, would Jude be in Bellingham, that category. Group, yeah. I'm um, trying to see. Calvin Phillips, like, yeah, he's 25, so he's been with fans, but not like the highest of levels. Yeah. Um, Phil Foes and Mason Mount. Uh, those guys really only came to their own only came to their own under their COVID. I know Mount got a little bit before COVID when Lampard first was uh, started with Chelsea. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Chelsea, but um, Bukaya Saka with East Starks, he hasn't done much. So yeah, I mean, there's, there's plenty of experience on the team as well. Obviously, Grealish has been doing it since he was a teenager. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kane, if he decides to show up. Sterling, <laughs> Uh, Pickford, who I hate Pickford for everything. I guess I hate him. I think he's hilarious for everything and how hilariously bad he is. But he always seems to show up for England, so I can't complain. You know what? I've been I've been saying this. Uh, we we have group chats, and you guys make fun of me because I said Pickford shows up for England. And like ah, he's like the third or fourth best choice. I said no. Pickford shows up for oh. England. The reason I know that, the reason why I know that that works for keepers, is because. The United States has had our heart broken by by fucking Ochoa from Mexico for years and years, who has never showed up on a club level. But when he puts on the Mexico shirt, for some reason he turns into Superman. So I understand how it works. He, him, and Pickford are the same size. They have the exact. They play the exact same way. And Ochoa has been F. breaking our hearts for years. Yeah, yeah same. Uh, yeah. That that's no. why I knew Pickford was going to show up in this tournament. <laughs> I still think Nick Pope is the better goalkeeper, and if he That's was fair. fit, he'd be starting. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, even at least James, did he play much pre covers uh, I mean, I I knew of him, but I think it was I don't I don't think he started really at all. I, yeah. I mean, he was there. Yeah, I and mean, you know, Luke Shaw, John Stones, Harry Maguire, Henderson. Now he's back healthy. So like, I mean, we still have plenty of guys. But yeah, we. I think some of the big stars, namely Phil Fosen and Mason Mount, at least Mount had some experience before COVID. Um, Saka, he got mango match in the last game. I'm hoping he gets more time, to be honest. Yeah. Oh, well, a yeah, lot believe, of these guys. I too. A lot of these guys were not with the team in this capacity during the World Cup, which would have been the last time that, oh, exactly. that uh, they were around fans on the international level which i mean for any of us who have been to international uh international games there there just is a different there's a different yeah. level uh, of oh, of oh. noise there's just a different there's a different atmosphere so a lot of these guys who have made their breakthrough in the last 18 months or really since the world cup um, they have yet to experience what they would experience in the semi semis and finals of this tournament I mean, I was, I was looking at some of the games that started against Croatia in 2018. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, a lot of them are still the team now. But in midfield, this is literally our quote-unquote midfield four. Um, Kieran Trippier, who scored the free kick, technically lined up as a right mid, but I'm sure he was tracking back. Yeah, Ashley, he really played like a right yeah. back in that game, to be honest. Ashley, Ashley Young. 
Jesse Lingard and Delhi Ali. Jeez. Uh, and he, he scores us in the semi final. Um, Danny Rose came off the bench. She's yeah, disappeared. Yeah. Eric Dyer, he's been woeful anyway. He's just good at penalties. <laughs> um, yeah, and you know, there's guys on the bench Phil Jones, Fabian Delph, Gary Cahill, Danny Welbeck. All those guys have dropped out of the picture. Yeah, um, yeah. Jamie Vardy actually came on, and to be honest, I think he should be with the team. Vardy over Kane, for Christ's sake. Um, uh, can't argue with that, certainly given the way Kane is playing. But it's interesting that there has been that much turnover. It kind of doesn't feel like there has been, maybe because I follow the Premier League closer than any other uh, club competition in the world. Yeah. So I, I've known about all these guys that end up with the English setup, you know, before that actually happens but yeah. when you say the names i mean it just it feels like the entire complexion of the team is different than it was yeah. in 2018 and i mean the starting line look there's still plenty of guys who are starting right now Pickford was in goal you've got Maguire, stones and walker at the back um henderson was in the six trippier i says and then harry king and raheem still and we're up top yeah so i mean it, it's still you know Basically, what, seven of your starting 11, taking out Young, Lingard, and Halley. They're still pretty much starters right now. Mm -hmm. So it's not insane. It's more than you look down the bench at some of the players who they've been replaced by the likes of Bakaya Saka and Jack Grealish and um, Duke Bellingham. Those kind of more of the younger generation. Yeah. Well, it's just interesting when you you contrast it to, uh, let's... I guess, say, for example, Belgium, uh, a team that, you know, like we mentioned, have kind of there was this perception that there was the golden generation for Belgium. They weren't able to get quite to the precipice. They got close on several occasions. They weren't able to uh, finally get over that that last hump. And now it kind of feels like they might be aging out. Um, But, you know, this is a team that really showed out during the group stages, one of the best teams, in my opinion, uh, in the group stages. And it's with a lot of the same guys that have been around the Belgium setup for years now. I mean, you have Lukaku has kind of, you know, gotten himself a new life, so to speak. Um, so he yeah. looks like a different player, but he's been with the setup for a long time. Obviously, uh, guys like De Bruyne, Axel Witzel's been playing. Um, even on the back line, where it's oh, that's whew. been that's been the place where uh, there's been the most aging, and it seems like there should be the most change, but. Jason Denier and Thomas Vermaelen are still there, and Jan Vertonghen's still on the team. It's like, it, it, it when you compare that to England, um, it feels like England is is coming out with a lot of new faces um, relative to a lot of these other teams that are there. I don't know if that'll end up being an advantage for them or a disadvantage. I think it could be either, and there's just really no way to predict it. I mean, you just don't know how these guys are going to react to these kinds of situations. Yeah, you know, I completely agree. Don't really have much else to say, to be honest. It, it, you know, I could go off into a really interesting tangent. I was talking about last night about the lost generation of US soccer, um, which could be a whole discussion by itself. And I'm... we talked, we had a video a while ago about US grassroots and how we can. Sh- it was after the Olympic failure. Yeah, right, right. Uh, and you know, you, you look at all these Americans coming through now and. Under the Jürgen Ye- Ye- Klingsman era, there wasn't much real, real growth. And between <laughs> between a, a Tim Howard, Langdon Donovan, Clint Dempsey, Josie Alstadog, who was that yeah. era, and then like very few kinds of slip through, like John Brooks and whatnot in the middle, which yep. is why you saw such an old team that obviously then failed to go qualify for the 2018 World Cup. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and then we've now got. The, the grassroots and US soccer has kind of been revived out mm-hmm. of the Clinton era and now you've got all these young players absolutely um, which what, is a whole conversation but yeah I mean I would be absolutely happy to to make a video uh, specifically about that talking about that and hearing your perspective on it um, but I think that is valuable to connect back to the Euros because in a general sense when things like that happen it happens gradually and then suddenly, right? So as a U.S. fan, when you think about the 2014 World Cup, there was so much to like that happened in that tournament, and ultimately the team loses to Belgium in extra time, and so you feel like 
after the triumphs in the group stages and beating Ghana and, and doing what they did, um, to go up and lose to Belgium, you're kind of like, yeah, well, Belgium's a favorite in this tournament. That was that was in the heart of the Belgium uh, golden generation. That was when all those guys were in their prime in 2014. Yeah. They were actually my pick to win the tournament that year. Yeah. So, yeah. so as a U.S. fan, I'm kind of like, you know, it, it, it's fine. This is a team that can actually get it done. I mean, you even take Belgium to extra time. Um, this is a team that could potentially get it done. And then in two years, they're failing to qualify for a World Cup. I mean, or three years, they're failing to qualify for a World Cup. It's like, what the hell happened to all these guys? And you don't realize that all these players that you have developed this attachment to because they represent your country, you don't realize that they've aged out and that they yeah. can decline quickly. Yeah. And I, the same thing happened to Germany. It just happened to them during a World Cup. Yeah, yeah, that last World Cup was atrocious for Germany. Yeah, but because uh -huh. the exact same thing happened, I think they didn't they didn't realize how how old and and how I don't want to say outdated, but but how predictable they were becoming as a team, and then they just they figured it out. They found out in the World Cup, um, yep. and that that is what can happen to you, which is why Belgium is such an interesting case to me because it feels like it should have happened to them. Yeah, I mean, I'm just looking right now at that 2014 team for USA got lost to Belgium. Holy shit. <laughs> um, I mean, you got Tim Howard in goal, which is fine. Along the back line, Demarcus Beasley, Matt Beasley, Omar mm. Gonzalez, and Jeff Cameron. <laughs> it's like, yeah, in, a, in what looks to be a midfield, because I guess back then Graham Zussi was a little bit higher. So yeah, yeah Graham Zussi and Jermaine Jones. Um, and the, then up top, what? the midfield was kind of the real issue there. Just because, just yeah. because Zussi is so comfortable, you know, moving laterally, that you exactly. often end up with just Jermaine Jones in there, and he just really, yeah. he really couldn't control it the way that he needed to. And from Sudan was obviously Michael Brasley, um, Alejandro Bedoya, mm -hmm. and um, Bedoya. Yeah, right, and Fabian Johnson with Clint Dempsey just ahead of him. So, you know, back then, and especially, you know, we talked about this a while ago, and this because linking to the whole video, nowadays the best US team was mostly Europe-based. Back oh, yeah. then, it was MLS-based, and the, the direction of US soccer was moved, and I was chatting to Peter Vermees of Sports and KC about this just last week, because obviously the Gianluca luca Buzio interest from Europe, um, he was saying himself that, uh, you know, you look at the likes of like what Dallas is doing and brings in Aronson left and, you know, basically all these American players going to Europe. Yeah. Um, MLS is, MLS and US soccer's evolved now to, it, it, it sounds bad what's a step in the right direction because these players are wanted, but it's gone from, you know, the national team and the best US players just being stuck in America mm -hmm. to now, they're developing really good players, but right. Europe is like, ah, we want them while we're young. Or even even if they're a little bit older, you know, there's been older players who have went to Europe mm -hmm. um, and they're plucking them from MLS. And that is the stage MLS is in, which sounds bad because they're losing the best players. But that's only a positive directional sign because they're saying, all right, these players are good enough for Europe. Yeah. If you get enough who stay in MLS, the quality of the league goes up. And yeah. that's what he was saying with John Luca Buzio would obviously love to keep him through his whole career because of how good he is, but that's not fair to him, it's not realistic. And ultimately, he doesn't have any issues with losing Boozier because that's the direction that MLS and US soccer is going in right now, and it's only a positive. Yeah, and, and I absolutely agree. I, I always compare it to, uh, to Germany when they were rebuilding their setup uh, right around, you know, right around 2000, the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, they had something very similar, you know. The the Bundesliga was was, I don't want to say in tatters, but it certainly was nowhere near the level that we know it today. Uh, yeah. Their national team was not performing. Uh, you know, they're they're dealing with all of this, and they did something very similar. A lot of their players ended up leaving the country and going to play in more established leagues for more established clubs. Um, and as a as a national team setup, they embraced that. And, and they said it doesn't it doesn't matter 
that they're not playing here now because in 15 years they will be and in 15 years we want to win a world cup and then lo and behold 15 years later they did and 15 yeah. years later the bundesliga becomes one of the most competitive one of the most entertaining leagues in the world um, and so the u.s i'm not necessarily saying that that i mean in my opinion that could be the ceiling and should be the ceiling I'm for sure the they. united states that's obviously a whole other that's a whole other discussion that we have had before but just the idea that you can build that way that the national team success can and does lead to the success of your domestic league which then fuels your national team success is kind of a circle if that circle breaks like we saw for the u.s there are disastrous results as we have seen in the history of this of, of this team but if that circle works then you really you get success on a very high level um, yeah. like we've seen with Germany and I mean even you know Spain is the same thing they were fueled by Barcelona having the the amount of success that they did and then later on you know it was Real Madrid and then Barcelona and Real Madrid it's the same thing yeah. with Spain and that was, Spanish team that dominance was basically the Barcelona team you know it was Barcelona tiki taka exactly on that level it was, it was terrifying oh yeah absolutely absolutely I mean it was beautiful to watch uh, especially because yeah. I was really just getting into soccer at the time and so you're like yeah. Man, how do these, like, how the hell does this work? <laughs> like, it doesn't seem I, I, human. I was literally just, I got drinks with a friend earlier, uh, which means I'm now behind on work and we should probably stop <laughs> soon. <laughs> we'll stop talking, uh, we'll stop talking about the US men's national team in a video about the Euros. Yeah, I know. But I know this is about Spain. Um, but yeah, she was saying that she first got into soccer around when it was got to Spain, Dominic Sierra. Mm hmm. And she had a cousin who was super into soccer and like Spain, and that's how she got into soccer. Basically, she, you know, she likes the US obviously, but she had a soft spot for Spain because that attractive type of football and everything they won, um, and specifically Fernando Torres. Uh, that's who she said, uh, not my works, but obviously <laughs> former Liverpool player. Well, no, she specifically mentioned him. Mm. Um, that's, that's what got her into soccer, watching that goes Spain teams. Yeah. Yeah, anyway. I mean, it's it's yeah. easy to watch as a casual. And to to connect it all full circle, the fact that Spain as a as a team now is still dealing with the aftermath of that and how they want to how they want to redo their team uh, is a big reason why they haven't gotten back to to that level of success. It's a big, it's a big reason why you know when you look at their potential run through the Euros, they'd have to have probably an unexpected win over Croatia as good as Spain looks I, I for me Croatia's the favorite honestly in in, in that one or at the very least they're very very even um, mm. and then potentially France in the quarterfinals I mean this is it's just interesting to see on the international level there's there can be so much fluctuation even though you know ultimately Spain is still here they're still in the round of 16 of the euros but yeah. you know this time 10 years ago it was like they were unbeatable. I mean, I think Spain would still be extremely good if they had a, a true killer forward. And Gabe yeah. Morata. That sounded very American. Gabe Morata. <laughs> Morata. Um, Gabe Morata, who, you know, he's he finally showed up in the most recent game. Granted, it was 5 0. Uh, he didn't have a great. I think he scores in the second game, too, to be fair to him. But he missed a penalty and had a pretty bad first game. Yeah. And. Um, even well, in the I second was, game, yeah. he, he wasn't really there that much. I mean, he, he, for the goal, he was there, but other than that, yeah. didn't really factor much. Exactly. Um, but again, like when you said Croatia was favourite, and just got to have watched Croatia a little bit more. Mm -hmm. He didn't press in England at all. Um, they were losing to Czech Republic, and then gave somehow snuck into second place because of a three-one win over Scotland. Who, let's be honest, it's Scotland. Yeah, yeah, all right, fair enough, fair enough. Maybe I was maybe I was overstating that a little bit. Bucky just Bucky just went to a final, so again, gave Bucky experience. So who knows? Yeah, 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 you're absolutely Excellent. right. Uh, uh, well, yeah, the uh, the knockout stages begin in just a couple days. Uh, obviously, Sean and I, and probably all of you, will be glued to the television watching all these matches go down. And uh, hopefully, next week we will get back here do this again when we have. Uh, some some quarterfinal and, and semifinal action to to talk about. So there's a whole lot going on, and uh, this, as always, was a lot of fun. So Sean, please tell the people where they can find you when uh, we're wrapped up here. Yeah, uh, as always, just on Twitter, Sean Goodwin KC. 
And if you want to read any of my stuff, I promise it's half decent. Uh, KansasCity.com, which is the Kansas City Stars website. All right. There you go. There you go. Well, well worth your time to go check that out. I can guarantee you. So, Sean, thanks for uh, coming on and, and talking to us here. Hopefully next week we will have even more of uh of an interesting discussion and and maybe maybe we will get to that uh u.s video that we were talking about earlier talking about uh, the lost generation that would be very interesting so the gold cup video yeah well oh i mean obviously with the gold cup approaching i'm sure we'll get into that as well so absolutely yeah. uh so we will see you all next week talking about euro knockout stages until then enjoy the action we'll see it we appreciate you